State surveillance has been an integral part of American political life far longer than we might imagine. The modern surveillance state is now ubiquitous. It's everywhere, all the time. In 2013, Edward Snowden may have proved that the state, along with corporations, is illegally spying on U.S. citizens. Yet, the state surveillance industry has been around for a long time, and this isn't the first time the CIA spied on U.S. citizens. Let's take a deep dive into the origins of this ubiquitous industry. How did it develop? And how far does it actually go? Welcome to the Global Network. Please support us by clicking the like button and subscribing to our social media accounts to stay up to date with our content. If you want to go further, consider joining our organization by visiting our website, spaceforpeace.org. There are two relationships to pay attention to during this video. One is the relationship between foreign policy and domestic policy. A foreign policy of militarism abroad always has real impacts at home. What the U.S. military tests and perfects overseas eventually makes its way towards the people on U.S. soil. And two, the relationship between public and private sectors of intelligence. The surveillance state is always a surveillance industry, whereby state institutions such as the FBI, CIA, the armed forces, and so on, have an indispensable relationship with industry. Sometimes referred to as the military industrial complex, but as one may continue to learn about the reality of the US state and imperialism, we soon find that this term just doesn't go far enough. Historian Alfred McCoy has tracked the origins and development of the current global surveillance apparatus and provides us a framework to understand this complex set of state institutions and corporate monopolies. In his book, In the Shadows of the American Century, he tracks the origin point and development of what he calls information regimes. Starting about 150 years ago, new technologies arose which provided the ruling classes of the U.S. the methods to begin surveilling, tracking, spying, and collecting information in a highly organized way. Since then, McCoy states that there have been three information regimes. The manual information regime, the computerized information regime, and the robotic information regime. The U.S. military first created a manual information regime for Philippine pacification, then a computerized apparatus to fight communist guerrillas in Vietnam. Finally, during its decade-plus in Afghanistan and its years in Iraq, the Pentagon has begun to fuse biometrics, cyber warfare, and a potential future triple canopy aerospace shield into a robotic information regime that could produce a platform of unprecedented power for the exercise of global dominion or for future military disaster. The first manual information regime begins in the U.S.-Philippines War of 1899-1902. But just before that colonial intervention began, we can go back just a few decades to understand the development of new technologies that enabled this information regime to establish itself. New technologies such as the commercial typewriter, the quadruplex telegraph, the telephone, the punch card, photo engraving, the Dewey Decimal System, fingerprint classification, biometric identification systems, and much, much more. These innovations allowed for filing, tabulating, organizing, automating, recording, and retrieving huge amounts of information. As McCoy states, In one extraordinary decade, from the 1870s to the 1880s, that information revolution arose from a synergy of innovations in the management of textual, statistical, and visual data, creating for the first time the technical capacity for surveillance of the many, rather than the few, a defining attribute of the modern state. These new technologies led to the first standing military intelligence agency, the Military Information Division, set up in 1885. Later came the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. The conquest of the Philippines unleashed the potential of these new technologies to form the country's first information regime as the army battled in extraordinary arrays of insurgents, 
National Army, Urban Underground, Militant Unions, Messianic Peasants, and Muslim Separatists. In the process, the colonial government formed three new services seminal for the creation of counterintelligence capacity. A division of military information, which developed internal security methods later applied to the United States. The Philippines Constabulary, that pacified the new colony's insurgency through pervasive surveillance and a highly efficient Manila Metropolitan Police. During this period, a U.S. Army officer develops new doctrines that would later be implemented throughout the entire intelligence and counterintelligence apparatus, and he would eventually become known as the father of U.S. military intelligence. His name? Ralph Van Diemen. After the war in the Philippines, the U.S. dismantled its intelligence structures. But later, when entering World War I and realizing that the military again required an intelligence structure, who did they look to? Ralph Van Diemen. Immediately, this born-again military intelligence branch was used against civilians at home, where there was a surge of dissent against the war. Intelligence agents and analysts targeted immigrants, dissenters, labor organizers, anarchists, communists, and anyone else caught in the mix. Here, Van Diemen fused federal agencies, civilian agencies, and military branches that would install common intelligence operations for the next half century. This included J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, private security forces like the Pinkertons, and even so-called patriotic organizations like the Protective League and the American Legion, all to build an extensive network of informants, agents, and infiltrators to bring down anyone they choose to target but mainly political targets. In 1940, Van Diemen, J. Edgar Hoover, and the Chief of Army Intelligence in a confidential meeting developed the Delimitations Agreement. This agreement basically divided the world up, with counterintelligence of the Americas overseen by the FBI and the rest of the world to military intelligence. In the Army-Navy-FBI Communications Intelligence Agreement of 1942, whereby the Military Intelligence Division and the Office of Naval Intelligence were to have cognizance over the services military and civilian personnel in espionage, counter-espionage, and sabotage matters, while the FBI would have that responsibility for civilians. This set the ground for the later development of the Office of Strategic Services and later the Central Intelligence Agency. Additionally, during World War II, the Five Eyes Alliance was established, a multilateral UK-USA agreement for a joint cooperation in signals intelligence, usually abbreviated as SIGINT, between the UK, US, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Five Eyes has, over the years, been called Nine Eyes and even Fourteen Eyes, where more nations, mainly in Europe, have been included within signal intelligence. The Five Eyes Alliance is basically an agreement where each nation state spies on one another's citizens and then shares the collected information with each other in order to circumvent restrictive domestic restrictions. The Second Computerized Information Regime the second information regime can be traced back to the Vietnam War from 1965 to 1975, where information became computerized. The U.S. military produced dot matrix computer maps of the Vietnamese countryside using advanced IBM computers. They compiled tabulations of security in 12,000 villages in South Vietnam and filed 3 million documents on enemies which were captured on giant reels of barcoded film. The U.S. Air Force spent $800 million a year in Laos to build a network of 20,000 acoustic, seismic, and thermal sensors to pinpoint truck convoys. This information was gathered on computerized systems in order to inform their targeted bombing. A predecessor to the third robotic regime, the Vietnam War pushed the U.S. military to use the Fire B target drone. It would transform into an increasingly agile unmanned aerial vehicle 
that would make over 3,000 sorties over China, North Vietnam, and Laos. By 1972, the SCTV drone was capable of flying 2,400 miles, equipped with a camera producing a low-resolution television image. Southeast Asia was now an electronic battlefield for the U.S. military. All of this computerized information collection was, again, used on civilians at home. Infamous programs were created, COINTELPRO, Echelon, the Phoenix Program, and many, many others. Political organizations such as the Black Panther Party, Students for a Democratic Society, anti-war and civil rights organizers, and other various political groups and leaders. Again, we see that these new doctrines and technologies were first tested and developed on the Vietnamese people, then brought back home to be used against any dissent from within. The Third Robotic Regime The Global War on Terror, mainly the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, fostered the development of the Third Robotic Information Regime. Newer technologies were developed electronic surveillance, biometric identification, and drone warfare, all of which are fusing together to create a more powerful and more destructive information regime to date. With biometric identification collection, information on millions of Iraqis and Afghans were stored and could be accessed instantaneously by satellite link to a computer center in West Virginia. Drone warfare and technologies were accelerated in the airstrike campaigns in Afghanistan, and all electronic communication was being tracked, monitored, and stored. In this stage, cyber warfare capability was consistently being tested and developed. A new combatant command was established in 2009, the Cyber Warfare Command. It declared cyberspace as a new operational domain, just like they did with the air, land, and sea, and now outer space. The US military now has a cadre of cyber warriors capable of launching offensive operations, such as a variety of attacks against the computerized centrifuges in Iran's nuclear facilities. Now, the fusion of aerospace, cyberspace, biometrics, and robotics have created an unprecedented information power regime for the US military and its ruling classes. A highly explosive mix of corporations, state institutions, and private groups are developing the intelligence collection industry day by day. By 2010, over 854,000 employees across the country held top secret security clearances. Dana Priest and William M. Arkin from the Washington Post says, Every day across the United States, 854,000 civil servants, military personnel, and private contractors with top secret security clearances are scanned into offices protected by electromagnetic locks, retinal cameras, and fortified walls that eavesdropping equipment cannot penetrate. They estimated in 2010 that out of these 854,000 employees, 265,000 are contractors. From 2001 to 2010, 33 building complexes were built with the sole purpose of top secret intelligence work. Altogether, they occupy the equivalent of three pentagons, about 17 million square feet. Today, there are over 3,000 intelligence organizations that exist, public and private, all aimed at collecting the world's data. In the past decade alone, the biometric identification market has exploded, from being tested on Iraqis and Afghans to now being used by local law enforcement on U.S. citizens. In 2011, the Army's Biometric Identity Management Agency, collected fingerprints and iris scans of 10% of the Iraqi population, about 3 million. In 2012, it held 10% of the Afghanistan population, about 2 million. Two years later, BI2 Technologies, a multimodal biometric identity company, began marketing a mobile app that allows police to use their phones to take photos of suspects, 
which then uses facial recognition technology to compare the photo to a database of other photos. In the same manner, the Biometric Optical Surveillance System, or BOSS, was first developed to identify suicide bombers in Iraq and Afghanistan, but was then transferred to Homeland Security, which continued developing the technology for future domestic use by local police. Today there is a global market for eye recognition systems, specifically focused on building an entirely new industry for eye recognition alone. Much of it is based on the technologies developed during the global war on terror where innocent Iraqi and Afghan people were used as test equipment. Intelligence is clearly an integral part of the US empire to both perpetuate its global power as well as repress any dissent within. This intelligence branch of the 21st century is marked by the development of what McCoy calls the Pentagon's triple canopy of pervasive surveillance systems, a blend of aerospace, cyberspace, and artificial intelligence, completing a new military regime of robotic warfare. In the end, these three information regimes provide us a framework for understanding the historical development of the modern surveillance industrial complex. It begins with tests and experiments overseas. Technologies become refined and used on the people at home. Some call this the boomerang effect. Others understand this as the true nature of the capitalist imperialist state. No country, no nation can sustain both an empire abroad and a democracy at home.